missing? What time is it? Oh god. Wait, Winston! Didn't you get that teleportation device set up the other day? Then what are we doing? We got all the time in the world, buddy! Let's go! Man, what do you say you zap me on over to the school? Alright, so I just stand underneath this thing? Alright, I guess just send me on my way whenever you're ready. Ooh, that's a little bit. Welcome back for our final unit review video. Had to have a solid final introduction for you, so there you go. Our last unit review is going to focus on Unit 9, Social Psychology. And for the last time ever, be sure you are filling all this information out in your unit review guide. Once you have all the information down from this unit, your review guide will be complete. How exciting. For this review video, we are going to start off by explaining what exactly social psychology is. Then we're going to move on to attribution theories and person perception. Then we're going to take a look at how our attitudes form and change. From there, we'll move on to conformity, compliance, and obedience. And we're going to end things off with taking a look at how the group influences our behavior and our mental processes. So, let's get started. What exactly is social psychology? What do social psychologists study? Social psychology is just going to be the scientific study of how we think about, influence, and relate to one another. Social psychologists are going to focus on how the group influences our individual behavior. It is important that we do not confuse social psychology with sociology. A sociologist is going to focus on society as a whole and study patterns of group behaviors, while, as I just mentioned, a social psychologist looks at how these influences affect individual behavior. A social psychologist may study how a certain person acts differently in different situations. Social cognition refers to the mental processes that people use to make sense of their social environment. Now let's dig a little deeper into the field of social psychology. To start off, we're going to take a look at attribution theories and person perception. Person perception refers to the mental processes that we use to form judgments and draw conclusions about the characteristics and motives of other people. According to research done by social psychologists, psychologist, in one-tenth of a second, we evaluate others' attractiveness, likability, competence, trustworthiness, and aggressiveness. Four key principles are going to guide person perception. While I explain these four principles to you, I want you to imagine you are getting on a crowded bus filled with strangers. Principle one of person perception states that our reactions to others are a result of our perception of them, not who they really are. When getting on the bus, you decide not to sit next to the big angry looking dude with the motorcycle vest because you perceive him as threatening, even though he could be a nice fellow who's just exhausted from his long day volunteering at the puppy shelter. Principle two states that our self-perception also is going to influence how we perceive others. For our bus scenario, let's say we just took three scoops of pre-workout, we're feeling pretty tough and intimidating. We walk right over to the motorcycle man, pop down in that seat right next to him. Principle three states that our goals in a particular situation determine the amount and kinds of information that we collect about other people. Let's say we're on the bus and we're not feeling too social and we just want to be left alone. We may look to sit next to someone who appears to be preoccupied and will probably leave us alone. And our last principle of person perception, Principle four states that in every social situation, we evaluate people partly in terms of how we expect them to act within the particular context. Let's say you see an empty row while making your way down the aisle of the bus. You decide you're gonna sit down in this row because it goes with the established societal norm. Generally, people might think it's a little weird if you sit next to them when there's empty rows on any type of public transit. Now let's talk about attribution theory. 
Attribution theory is the theory that we tend to give casual explanations for people's behavior, attributing it either to the situation or the person's disposition. Imagine you're in a store and you see a wife yelling at her husband. You think to yourself, is this husband just a jerk with an aggressive personality, which is considered a dispositional attribute, or is this behavior a reaction to a situational event, like maybe their wife admitting to running up their credit card bill on shoes, making the usually mellow husband angry? Oftentimes we experience what is known as fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error is the tendency for observers, when analyzing another's behavior, to underestimate the impact of the situation and overestimate the impact of personal disposition. Let's say that your teacher is handing back tests and you look over and see that your classmate got a very bad grade. We might attribute our classmate's bad grade to them being lazy and not studying, even though there could be several situational factors that led to the poor grade. Not enough sleep, sick, issues in the family, and a whole bunch of other things. While we often attribute others' actions and behaviors to dispositional qualities, we do have a tendency to attribute our own behaviors to external situational characteristics. This is referred to as the actor-observer bias. Before our next concept, I would like to tell you a story. Keep note of each character in the story because I am going to ask a few questions at the end of the story. Disclaimer, I did not create this story. I found it as a resource on the interweb. Our story starts with Billy and Sue, a married couple. Bill and Sue live in a large city where a big river runs right through the center of the city. A lot of the industrial workplaces and entertainment are on one side of the city, while a bunch of homes are on the other side of the city. Billy worked nights and would take a ferry to work, going across the river, and then returning each morning. Sue ended up becoming very tired with this arrangement. Feeling restless and lonely, she started to take the ferry into town while her husband was at work and had a series of affairs with various individuals. Anxious to preserve her marriage, Sue would always return home before Billy. And when a relationship became too intense, she would cause drama and break it off and then she would move on to the next. Well, one night, Sue was at Rory's house, whom she was having an affair with. Sue believed that it was starting to get a little too intense for her, so she started an argument. Rory proceeded to kick her out in the middle of the night, slamming the door right into her face. Sue decided to head back to the ferry so she could get home. When Sue arrived, she realized that she did not have her purse and she could not pay for the ferry ride. She returned to Rory's house, hoping he could spare some change, but still heartbroken, Rory did not answer the door. Sue remembered one of her ex-lovers, Horatio, lived a few blocks down. Unfortunately for Sue, Horatio was also still heartbroken and bitter from the breakup and refused to lend Sue the cash. Sue then returned to the ferry, where she pleaded with the boat captain to let her on, telling him that she is a regular and she will be sure to come back and pay for her ticket tomorrow. Captain Dan told Sue that he was extremely sorry, but it is against company policy to allow any passenger on board without paying for a ticket. Dawn was quickly approaching, and Sue knew that her husband would be returning home soon. She remembered then that there was a free bridge about a mile away from the ferry. The bridge was known for violent crime, but Sue was running out of options. While on the bridge, a thief approached Sue and demanded all of her money. Sue told the man that she had no money, but the thief refused to believe her. The thief attempted to search Sue, and she resisted. During the tussle, the thief stabbed Sue, and she died. So, that's our story. We had six characters. The husband, Billy. The wife, Sue. The first lover, Rory. The second lover, Horatio. Captain Dan. And the thief. What I want you to do is form a list from one to six, determining who is responsible for Sue's death. One being the most responsible, and six being the least responsible. So go ahead, pause the video, and think about how you would order your list. All right, so hopefully you had some time to think about how you would order your list. When told this story, oftentimes people place Sue at the number one or two spot on this list. In social psychology, this is known as blaming the victim. Victim blaming is the tendency to blame an innocent victim of misfortune for somehow having caused the problem or for not taking steps to avoid or prevent it. According to social psychologist Melvin Lerner, victim blaming oftentimes occurs as a result of the just world hypothesis, which is just the assumption that the world is fair and therefore people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. Blaming the victim reflects the belief that since the world is just, the victim must have done something to deserve his or her misfortune. Next up, we have the self-serving bias, which is our tendency to attribute successful outcomes of one's own behavior to internal causes and unsuccessful outcomes to external situational causes. So when I win at something, it is because of my skill. But when someone beats me, it's because they got lucky. And next up, we have the halo effect, 
The halo effect is just a tendency for an impression created in one area to influence opinion in another area. Even though it's called the halo effect, it can either positively influence or negatively influence your opinion on something. Let's say you were looking for a new car and you found the perfect one. Well, except for the fact that it's a very ugly color. The fact that you're so drawn away from the color of the car might lower your overall opinion of the car, even though it has a majority of the qualities that you were looking for. And the last concept that we talk about in this section has many names that are used interchangeably, which can get very annoying. Referred to as the Pygmalion or Rosenthal effect, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a phenomenon of someone predicting or expecting something, and this prediction or expectation comes true simply because the person believes it will, and the resulting behavior aligns to fulfill this belief. This concept was proven when psychologist Robert Rosenthal found that when teachers have higher expectations for their students, they perform better, while lower expectations lead to a decrease in performance. So if a teacher heard that little Johnny coming into their class is a lost cause and not worth their time, this thought might lead them to not giving Johnny as much attention he needs in order to be successful, which would result in Johnny's performance in class not being up to par. Now let's move on to our next social psychology topic of attitude formation and attitude change. Attitude is a belief and feeling that predisposes someone to respond in a particular way to objects, people, and events. If we think that someone isn't the nicest person ever, we might dislike them and act unfriendly towards them. Oftentimes, people can be persuaded and their attitudes can change. How can we explain this? The elaboration likelihood model suggests that attitude can change through evaluation of the content of a persuasive message or by irrelevant persuasion. As you can see on the board, the elaboration likelihood model includes both the central route to persuasion and the peripheral route to persuasion. When we're more invested and have the time and energy to think over an issue, we are more likely to be persuaded through the central route. Simply put, the central route to persuasion occurs when a person is persuaded by the actual content of a message. Well, what's gonna happen when we're less invested in a topic or we're pressed for time? Well, then we're more likely to be persuaded through the peripheral route. The peripheral route of persuasion is when we are persuaded by something other than the actual content of the message. So let's take a look at an example to see how the elaboration likelihood model can be applied in real life. Back in the 1990s, the Got Milk slogan was an advertisement campaign in the United States aimed at promoting the drinking of milk. Celebrities would be pictured with milk mustaches, which is just that thin layer of milk that rests on your upper lip after you've taken a delicious sip. Well, imagine someone walks into a convenience store just to purchase a drink. If the individual was pressed for time and just wanted to get a drink and pop in and out, we would see a lower level of elaboration. If they look in the fridge and see their favorite celebrity with a milk mustache, that might persuade them just to buy the milk. In this scenario, the individual would have been persuaded through the peripheral route. Well, let's say someone's very health conscious and very in tune with what goes in their body. They might have a higher level of elaboration on the issue and decide not to buy the milk even if their favorite celebrity was pictured on the card. In 1957, psychologist Leon Festinger published a theory of cognitive dissonance, where Festinger proposed that human beings strive for internal psychological consistency to function mentally in the real world. If we experience internal inconsistencies, we experience psychological discomfort and try and find ways to reduce this feeling of discomfort. This is the whole idea behind cognitive dissonance, which according to Festinger, is an unpleasant state of psychological tension or arousal that occurs when two thoughts or perceptions are inconsistent with one another. This is typically a result of when attitudes and behaviors clash. An example, let's say your whole life you were raised thinking that people who ate bananas were bad. When one day you go off to college, meet your new roommate, and you two really hit it off. A couple weeks go by and things are great. You and your roommate have become such close friends. So you now have two current beliefs. One, people who eat bananas are bad people. And two, my roommate is a good person. But one night you're sitting in your dorm studying when your roommate walks in, eating a banana. Now your two beliefs begin to conflict one another. Your whole life you were raised thinking that everyone who ate a banana was a bad person. However, your roommate, a banana eater, is someone you consider to be a good person. Now that we have these two inconsistent thoughts, Festinger states that we will then aim to reduce the level of cognitive dissonance we are experiencing. In our scenario, this can be accomplished in several ways. One, some people just decide to ignore the problem at hand and just not think about it. Not the healthiest of methods of dealing with an internal struggle, but oftentimes the easiest. 
Well, what happens if it is unavoidable to think about and it just keeps on gnawing at you day and night? Well, then one of your beliefs are going to have to change. You can either come to the conclusion that what you have thought growing up your whole life is wrong and that people who eat bananas might not always be bad people, or you may even come to the conclusion that your roommate is really not that good of a person as you thought they were. You may even go as far as convincing yourself that your roommate was never really eating a banana in the first place. Well, that does it for attitude formation and change. Now let's move on to our next topic of conformity, compliance, and obedience. Conformity is the act of adjusting your opinions, judgments, and behaviors so that they match the opinions, judgments, and behaviors of other people or the norms of a social group or situation. In 1962, psychologist Solomon Ash conducted his experiment on conformity. Ash wanted to investigate the extent in which social pressures from a majority group could affect a person to conform. Ash would have a group of eight college students participate in a simple perceptual task. In reality, all but one of these participants were actors who were involved in the experiment. The actors knew the true aim of the experiment but they were introduced to the subject as other participants. Each student was shown a card with a line on it, followed by another card with three lines on it. These lines were labeled A, B, and C. One of the lines on the second card was identical in length to the line on the first card, while the other two lines were clearly longer or shorter. Each participant was then asked to say out loud which line on the second card matched the length of the line on the first card. The actors were given specific instruction on how to answer each question. The actors would always unanimously nominate the same line, but on certain times they would give the correct response, while on others they would give the incorrect response. The students were sitting in a way that the real participant of the study would always answer last. The goal of the study was to see if the subject would go against what they believed to be the correct response and conform to the group's decision. After 18 trials, in the control group, with no pressure to conform to actors, the error rate was less than 1%. Even in the experimental group, a majority of participants' responses remained correct, meaning they went against majority opinion. However, a sizable minority of 36.8% of participants conformed to the actors' incorrect responses. Commenting on the results of his study, Ash stated that intelligent, well-meaning young people are willing to call white black is a matter of concern. According to social psychologists, there are two types of social influences that influence our willingness to conform. Normative social influences are behaviors that are motivated by the desire to gain social acceptance and approval. Someone may decide to smoke at a party because everyone else is doing it and they desire that social acceptance and feeling of being part of a group even though they know smoking is bad for them while informational social influences are those behaviors that are motivated by the desire to be correct. When we are uncertain or doubt our own judgments, we might look towards the group as a source of accurate information. Now let's talk a little bit about obedience to authority. Here we're gonna talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment and we're also going to revisit the Milgram Experiment, which we talked about during our Unit 1 review in our Ethics section. Obedience is the performance of a behavior in response to a direct command. Conducted in 1971 by psychologist Philip Zimbardo, the purpose of the Stanford Prison Experiment was to understand the development of norms and the effects of roles, labels, and social expectations in a simulated prison environment. Several college students participated and were randomly assigned the role of prisoner or guard. Today, known as a fairly unethical experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment was forced to end early due to the poor treatment of the prisoners by the guards. According to Zimbardo, the results of the experiment demonstrates the powerful role that the situation can play on human behavior. Since the guards were placed in a position of power and looked at the prisoners as beneath them, they began to behave in ways that they would not usually act in everyday life. Now, there are several criticisms today of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Not only are ethical concerns linked to the Stanford Prison Experiment, under recent years, both the reliability and validity of the study has also come under fire. As we talked about in our Unit 1 review video, conducted in 1963, the purpose of the Milgram experiment was to measure the willingness of participants to obey authority figures who instructed them to perform acts that conflicted with their personal conscience. The participant would have to shock an individual at increasing levels each time they were to answer a question incorrectly. Unknowing to the participant, they were not actually delivering high voltage shocks. All of the responses from the test subject were just audio recordings. The researchers were testing how far the participant would go just because a man in a white lab coat told them to keep on going. 
Milgram found that 65% of participants would continue to the highest shock value of 350 volts, which would definitely kill someone. Subjects were very uncomfortable in doing so, showing signs of both tension and stress. They were sweating, trembling, biting their lips, stuttering their words. And if you have not already noticed, social psychology experiments do like to dance on that line of being ethically appropriate. All right, now on to compliance. Compliance is simply changing one's behavior due to the request or direction of another person. Unlike obedience, compliance does not rely on being in a position of authority. So why exactly do we comply with some demands even though we have the ability to say no? According to psychologists, this can be explained through both reciprocity and commitment. Reciprocity is the act of responding to a positive action with another positive action. The door and the foot technique is a reciprocity technique commonly studied by social psychologists where the persuader attempts to convince the respondent to comply by making a very large request that the respondent will most likely turn down. Think of it as a metaphorical slamming of the door into the persuader's face. The persuader does this in an attempt to make you agree to a second, more reasonable deal that you may not have originally agreed to if asked in isolation. Another reciprocity technique, the foot in the door technique, is when the persuader begins with small requests and gradually increases the demands of each request. As mentioned before, commitment also plays a role in compliance. Commitment techniques involve that's not all, and lowball techniques. That's not all is a two-step technique for enhancing compliance that consists of the persuader presenting an initial large request and then before the person can respond makes the request more attractive by reducing it to a more modest target. Think of this as one of your parents calling you and letting you know that you need to clean the house by the end of the night if you want to hang out with your friends this weekend. But then before you can even respond they say never mind how about just your room. You might feel like your parents are doing you a solid by only making you clean your room when they could have had you clean the whole house. So in return you clean the Room without any trouble. The lowball technique is a commitment technique where an attractive offer is presented at first and then when a person commits to it, it's changed at the last second. Having already committed to the deal, the individual may be obligated to follow through with it. This is a common tactic used by salespeople. And that does it for our conversation on conformity, compliance, and obedience. Now on to our last topic of how group influences can affect our individual behavior. This section is going to be very vocab heavy. Be prepared because I have a lot of information about to come your way. In psychology, a social group can be defined as two or more humans who interact with one another, accept expectations and obligations as members of the group, and also share a common identity. Norms are an understood rule for expected and accepted behavior. Norms prescribe proper behavior. An example of a norm could be making eye contact with someone while you're talking to them. If you were to deviate from this norm, you might make some people feel pretty uncomfortable. You get some pretty entertaining results when you have an entire conversation with someone staring at their shoulder or their forehead. It makes them pretty uneasy. Now onto our theories of group influence. Social facilitation refers to an improved performance of tasks while others are watching. This occurs with simple or well-learned tasks, but not with tasks that are difficult or not yet mastered. While social inhibition is the tendency to perform tasks more poorly or slower in the presence of others. Generally, this is because someone may not be an expert or has yet to master the task. So they might be worried or self-conscious about messing up in front of other people. Social loafing is a tendency for people in a group to exert less effort when pooling their efforts and attaining a common goal. So social loafing pretty much describes that kid that does absolutely nothing in all the group projects. That person might think, hey, this group's going to get it all done whether I help or not, so why waste my time with it? Well, on the other hand, social striving refers to enhanced work ethic while working towards attaining a shared goal. Social loafing is more prominent in individualistic cultures, while social thriving is more prominent in collectivistic cultures. Next, we have de-individuation, which refers to a loss of self-awareness and self-restraint occurring in group situations that foster arousal and anonymity. De-individuation can be used to explain things such as mob mentality and cyberbullying. Group polarization refers to the enhancement of a group's prevailing attitude through discussion within the group. Basically what happens is, the more you talk about your beliefs with those who share those same beliefs, the more they are strengthened and reinforced. Groupthink is the mode of thinking when the desire for harmony in a decision-making group overrides a realistic appraisal of alternate ideas. This can hinder group problem solving. A social trap is going to refer to a social situation in which people act to obtain 
short-term individual goals, which in the long run leads to the loss for a group as a whole. There used to be this game show on TV called Friend or Foe that was the perfect example of a social trap. In the game show, two strangers would be teamed up and presented with two options. Take all the prize money for themselves or share it with their partner. If both participants selected friend, it meant they shared the prize money. If both participants select foe, it means neither of them get the money. If one participant selects friend and the other participant selects foe, the one who selected foe gets to keep all the prize money for themselves. Basically, the purpose of the game was to either trust that your partner will select friend and share the money with you, or try to deceive them into thinking that you will select friend, when in reality you plan on selecting foe in an attempt to steal all the money. These situations made for some pretty comical moments on TV. The reciprocity norm states that we repay in kind what another has done for us. People will generally help each other out by returning favors done by one another. And our last topic of social influence will be the bystander effect. The bystander effect is the tendency for any given bystander to be less likely to give aid if other bystanders are present. This phenomenon can be explained to the idea of the diffusion of responsibility, which states a person is less likely to take responsibility for action or inaction when other bystanders or witnesses are present. Now that we have discussed the theories that explain the effect of group influence, we are now going to move on to bias, prejudice, and discrimination within groups. In 1954, Musafar and Carol Sharif conducted the Robbers Cave Experiment. The experiment took place at Robbers Cave State Park in Oklahoma. Researchers wanted to see if it was possible to bring two opposing groups together in order to build peace. Researchers posed as camp workers and observed a group of 22 11 and 12 year old boys who had never met and had comparable backgrounds. The experiment had three stages. Stage one involved in-group formation where the boys were arbitrarily placed into two separate groups. The two groups were named the Rattlers and the Eagles. Each group was unaware of the other's presence. Stage two involved creating friction between the two groups. They were introduced to one another and would compete with one another to win prizes. This led towards negative feelings towards the out groups. And stage three is going to be the integration stage where tensions were reduced through teamwork driven tasks that required intergroup cooperation. The Sharifs concluded that friction between groups can be reduced and positive intergroup relationships can be maintained only by the presence of subordinate goals that promote united cooperative action. While talking about the Robbers Cave experiment, you may recall me mentioning the terms in-group and out-group. In-group simply refer to groups in which we are members, while out-group refer to all groups that we are not members. When dealing with group conflict, it is important to understand the following terms. Prejudice is an unjustified negative attitude an individual has for another. This is based solely on a person's membership to a different racial or ethnic group. Discrimination occurs when prejudice attitudes result in unjustified behaviors. Stereotypes are generalized beliefs about a group of people. Sometimes there can be some grain of truth behind some stereotypes, but they are oftentimes overgeneralized. Now let's take a look at some of the concepts that explain the causes of conflict. The scapegoat theory is the theory that prejudice feelings provides an outlet for anger by providing someone to blame. Oftentimes throughout history, different groups are used as scapegoats for different events. An example could be Jewish people being blamed for the cause and the spread of the Black Plague back in the Middle Ages. Ethnocentrism is the belief that one's own culture or ethnic group is superior to that of others and the related tendency to use our own cultural norms as a standard by which to judge other cultures. And last, we have the outgroup homogeneity effect, which is the tendency to see members of outgroups as very similar to one another. If you go to a public school, you might think that all private school kids are rich and snobby, which might not be the case at all. So with all this conflict that we constantly see in the world, how can we go about increasing cooperation? The contact theory states that intergroup contact under appropriate conditions can effectively reduce prejudice between majority and minority group members. As we just mentioned, subordinate goals are shared goals that override the differences amongst people and require their cooperation in order to be successful. Another concept that we've talked about in previous units, the mere exposure effect basically states that we develop a preference for things just because we are familiar with them. Attraction also plays a role in increasing cooperation and forming friendships. Now onto our final topic of conversation, which is just going to be a quick discussion on altruism and aggression. Altruism refers to helping another person with no expectation of personal reward or benefit. 
An example of this could be you pulling over on the side of the road to help a stranger change their tire. Aggression, on the other hand, refers to verbal or physical behavior intended to cause harm to other people. Aggression can be categorized into two forms. Instrumental aggression refers to aggressive behavior intended to achieve a goal. Instrumental aggression could be a hockey player delivering an open ice hip check to an opponent in order to stop a breakaway. While hostile aggression is a type of aggression that is committed in response to a perceived threat, a very good modern example of hostile aggression is road rage. My oh my, that does it for our final unit review video. I just want to thank all of you for sticking around. I hope you are not annoyed with my voice at this point. Please do not forget to complete the progress check section of our social psych unit to make sure you understand everything we just went over. And once you do that, you get to fill out your certificate of participation for completing the review guide. Anyways, that does it for me. Winston, take me home, boss.